Welcome back to the I Am Power podcast, episode three, where we hear inspirational stories and then turn it into art that reminds us to be great. Today we're talking to April Wall, an engineer for NASA, and I just want to stop right there and say, oh my gosh, I'm a huge NASA fan. Um, So I was totally geeking out the entire time, and I can't thank her enough for being on and sharing her story with us. Um, I also want to say real quick, too, that today's episode could be considered sensitive for some listeners. Um, So with that being said, today's episode is about mental health, and we talked to April about what it was like to experience an illness that she didn't even know that she had for a good majority of her life, um, what the symptoms and signs looked like what it was like for her when she reached the brink of suicide and courageously sought help. Um, We talk about how far she's come, what her life looks like now with the help of medication and how we can be advocates for those that may be struggling with some of the same things that we've struggled with. I know I personally resonate with this episode. Um, I've struggled with mental health. I still struggle with mental health, and that's why I'm a huge advocate for it. I definitely think it's something that we should talk more about, and yeah, let's just, let's get right into it, guys. Having people tell me, like, be kind to yourself, and healing happens every day, made me feel a little less hard on myself for not getting better faster. So welcome to the show. Um, we have April with us today. I actually found you on Instagram through one of your inspiring posts. Um, and so I would have you introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about you. So my name is April Waugh and um, I'm primarily on Instagram for running because I'm a runner. I've done a few marathons, a lot of half marathons. And I also um, advocate a lot for mental illness after I've had my own journey with it. So um, between running and mental illness, those are the two things that really prompted me to, to go really hard and heavy on Instagram. And they're very much tied to one another. So right. Yeah. yeah. And so you said that you're a runner. Tell me a little bit about that. That's, I see your post and I'm like, oh my goodness, this girl is like superwoman over here. I think the right word for it is insane. <laughs> As in your post that you made today and you were like showing all of the, um, you called them, what was the word that you used for them? Yeah. Bib folios. Yeah. yeah. And you were, and so yeah. that's like a, like your number for every race yeah. that you've been in. Yeah. I keep my race bibs. Um, a lot of them are on my wall and I initially started putting them on my wall, but I eventually ran out of space and, um, my husband has a bunch of wine boxes in our basement that need to get moved. <laughs> um, so I can put my numbers up. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I've been running since I was 18. Uh, that was in 1998. So if that gives you any indication of how old I am, <laughs> Age I'm is not nothing but a number. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I initially started running in college because I was pretty stressed out my first semester. And I had a friend who said, you know, you should, you should run a 5k with me. You might like it. I was like, oh, no, you got to be <laughs> kidding me. I'm not doing that. Um, and I was like, well, how, how far is 5k? He's like three miles, three miles. Right. I can barely <laughs> even walk. that. <laughs> so here I am 22 years later, still running and, uh, three miles now to me. I look back on that time when I told my friend, you know, sure, fine, I'll, I'll do it grudgingly. And it just, you know, he was right about that. He was right about the stress relief and how good it makes you feel. And I mean, of course, he was a much better runner than me. He was on the um, university soccer team. So it's like, okay, well, you know, I'm not going to be able to compete with him. But the fact that he even offered the 5k was I, I think he knew that that was the gateway drug. <laughs> right. He's like, I know yeah. as soon as I can get her to do this, she's going to fall in yes. love with it. And you did. Yes. And that's I did. So awesome. And I'm still doing it. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. So is that, that's something that you do? Um, how many a year would you say that you try to like, do you give yourself oh. a goal or is it just kind of like whenever one pops up, you're like, I'm doing that. And you just maintain that 
uh, street? Um, well, so initially when I first started running, it was more for stress relief in college. And it was so, you know, engineering school was so grueling that I just, whenever I had time, I would run. I didn't really sign up for a lot of races. I would do maybe two or three a year because, you know, college was just intense and I wasn't sleeping enough and, you know, right. it was college. Right. Um, so then when I started working, I continued to run, but I started doing it more often and signing up for local races. And this was back before they had the online registration stuff. So you would fill out the paper and, and then I'd go and drive the course to make sure I knew where it was. Oh, and wow. Was, yeah. So it's like a serious 20s. thing. Yeah. Like you have yeah. to really prepare for that. That's awesome. Yeah. Again, this was when I was in my early twenties before I had like my family and before when I, you know, there was no real, like you had Google maps, like you had map quest. I don't yeah. even think Google maps was back back I don't then. even know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you print out the map, map quest. quest and yeah. Drive it. Yeah. yeah. And then you have to like, make sure that you're like, what, you know, I remember map quest. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that, you know, I no longer have time to do that. And plus we have the technology to look on our phone and say, okay, well, yeah, I, I know the terrain and this is the elevation gain and all that. And even then I still don't do that because I just don't have the time anymore. You know, right. I, I'm a mom and I work. Um, but yeah, running has been one of the few constants in my life. And I just, it's, you know, I feel a difference when I don't do it. And so my goal now, I've never really been the person to run competitively. Um, and the reason why is because the minute I bring competition into it, I, I have so many other things in life that require competition and stress and like, go, go, go and meet this goal and meet this deadline that I don't want to bring that to running. Right. Um, I want to run to enjoy myself. And if I'm not enjoying myself, then I, I would have quit a long time ago. Right. So it is my, it's the one thing that I can call my own that I've had before I even met my husband, before I even got my degree, before I had my daughter running has always been there. So that's amazing. Um, I don't, yeah. So I'm not a competitive runner. I will never be very fast. Um, I mean, I might do, a, I, I'm thinking about doing an ultra with one of my friends, but I haven't really. I haven't really decided on when I want to do that. Um, here in Colorado, you kind of have to work around the weather. <laughs> yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. I've never yeah. been to Colorado, but I heard it. I've heard it's beautiful and cold. It is. <laughs> um, so we just had a heat snap for about a week and it was like a hundred degrees and just dry. Oh my heat. goodness. <laughs> yeah. Um, so summer can be brutal. Um, winter can be more brutal. So you know, fall is a good time. So we'll see. I'm not yeah. sure when I'm ready to dip my toe in that pool. <laughs> yeah, I, I completely understand that. Um, so yeah. you're a mental health advocate. Um, yeah. Do you mind giving us a little bit of a backstory on how you um, have embraced that? Um, where did you, where did that come from? That's, that's led you to be the um, advocate that you are today. Right. So um, in retrospect, I do believe that my mental illness illnesses are genetic. Um, and the reason why I think that, and I, you know, I've run this by my doctor and, and both doctors and they both agree. Um, I've been struggling with something since I was 16 and I didn't know what that something was uh, until I was 35. So, wow. I mean, I've had on and off, bad spells since I was 16. I remember my junior year in high school, like I, I couldn't eat. Um, I was having really bad um, agoraphobia. I didn't want to be around people. Um, I had, you know, I was in the, the drama club and the choir club, and I would just have such bad stage fright that I would just miss performances completely. And um you know, it kind of cleared up on its own my senior year, but then it started happening again. And in, in, I think in college, I experienced something similar to hypomania. 
And I didn't know what it was. I thought, you know, I'm young. I just have a lot of energy. This is, a, this is why you go to college when you're young, because you have, you know, you don't get tired easily. And I, right. I mean, I would, I would be like awake, need very little sleep. And I was like taking on a lot of projects. I graduated with a 3.93 grade point average. Wow. And that's not because, you know, it's, looking back, it's not as impressive to me realizing that later on the, the depressive part of that was going to hit me. Yeah. Um, so I continued like that. And I, I mean, I was waking up at 5.00 AM, uh, studying, going to school. And then when classes were over at noon, I would drive to, you know, Las Cruces, my hometown's El Paso, Texas. So I drive the 40 miles to Las Cruces, work on my senior project till midnight, drive home, get four hours of sleep and do it all over again. And I did that for an entire year. Wow. And I still had this idea in my brain that, you know, this is normal. Everybody is like this when they're young. Right. right. When you're in college, like that's, the, yeah. that's, the, <laughs> that's what you right. hear that that's college life. You don't get a lot of sleep. You kind of work exactly. yourself to death. So you're thinking that this is yeah. normal. Okay. Right. And so I kind of just went on like that and I got a job in, in California. So, um, I went out there when I was 22, uh, with no friends or family in the area, started my first professional career, bought my first brand new car. I mean, everything was just new, 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 new. And I would say maybe five years into that, I got hit with what I now know was a pretty bad depressive episode. And again, I thought, well, maybe I'm just homesick or, you know, maybe I'm just stressed out. Maybe I'm not eating right. I I kept trying to normalize it in my brain and I continued to do that. Um, And it kind of resolved on its own. Um, I did have some pretty bad, you know, stretches where I I just could not get out of bed on the weekend. I'd, I'd go to work and I would just like, managed to just make it in time to Friday. And then just like, I would not get out of the weekend. Yeah. And so was that like, um, when you say that, do you mean like you were just really fatigued, really tired, or was it more of like, I just don't really feel good. Something's wrong. And so that's why I'm kind of just staying in the bed. Um, it was a little of both, although at the time, so I was, I was just exhausted from trying to like, just do my job. And, and like prior to that, I was, I was fine. I was doing my job and I didn't feel that tired on the weekend. And I thought, well, you know, maybe, maybe it's my thyroid because I do, I have Hashimoto. So I I went and had that checked and it came back normal. So I thought, well, maybe the doctor's wrong. Like that's the, that's the extent to which I normalize this. Like the doctor has to be wrong. There's nothing wrong with me. I'm fine. Yeah. And that kind of resolved on its own after, I don't know, maybe a year I was like that. Um, But then I I got married and things were great for a few years. I got married and then I had my daughter and we moved to Colorado. We changed jobs, moved to completely different state. We had no friends or family here. And you know, I put my daughter in daycare for the first time since she was born. And I I remember after I had my daughter, I lost weight pretty fast. And I thought, you know, because people will tell you, oh, that's because you're breastfeeding. And you know, that helps burn calories. And it does sometimes. But um, I came here in about a year after about a year of being here. um, I, I started feeling off, I couldn't put my finger on what was wrong. I didn't feel sad. And that's why I didn't know that it was depression because we have this idea in our head that depression means like, oh, you're really sad, but sadness is just one small piece of it. Right. Um, Depression will, it'll upend your sleep schedule. It'll disrupt your appetite. It will make you feel completely hollow. And so I started feeling a little bit off in the summer of 2015. And I thought, well, you know, I'm just tired. And my new, my new job is a little stressful. And my daughter's still really little. She's two years old. Um, 
so I just kept pushing and I kept muscling through and I'm like, well, this is what moms do, right? They just get things done. They just muscle through. Um, but then in October, I started having some really bad suicidal thoughts and they were not the kind like, oh, everything is just, you know, the world's caving in on me. It was more like they were intrusive ones oh. and I, it scared me. Yeah. And it got to the point where I couldn't go outside even to check the mailbox. That's how like terrified I was of like leaving my house. And then I even started to exhibit some symptoms of OCD where I would not go to certain areas of the house because I felt like the suicidal thoughts were worse in certain rooms. And it totally irrational looking back on it, but that that's, kind of the state of mind. And I thought, you know, I wasn't eating. I lost like 20 pounds in just two months. But every time I tried to eat, I felt nauseated. I couldn't yeah. sleep for more than like 45 minutes at a time. And I continued to try and normalize this like, okay, well, maybe something's wrong with my, my digestive system. So I, I made an appointment with a gastroenterologist. Yeah. And like, nothing, nothing's wrong. And so it got so bad um, one night that I was so terrified that I was going to do something to myself that I checked myself into the hospital because I, I knew that like, I can't, I cannot go on like this. My daughter needs me. Yeah. I don't know what's wrong. I'm going to put this in the hands of professionals. Right. And so that, that act of, I call it courage at the time. Absolutely. It felt like I was at the time. I felt like I'm just, I can't, I cannot, I've tried doing this on my own. I don't know what is wrong with me, but something is very wrong. Um, and that is what started me on the path to, to healing. So I got referred to a psychiatrist um, and he has a very excellent nurse named Susan. So Susan, if you're listening to this, I love you. Oh, yes. Um, Thank you, Susan. <laughs> um, so she, I remember she, I, I was just a mess when I showed up in his office the first time. Um, and he went down the list of everything, all the symptoms. And I was like, yes, 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 yes. And so he prescribed me my first medication, which was mirtazapine. And that helped because it got rid of the nausea that I had been feeling, I guess from anxiety or depression. I don't know, but my digestive system was just messed up. Right. But I took the mirtazapine that first night and it knocked me out. I slept and I woke up hungry. Wow. And although it, like all other antidepressants that took like a week to start feeling the mood change. The fact that I slept and I was hungry, I was like, I, it's, I'm functional. Yeah. That I'm functioning like a human again. Um, so that was the first step. And then my doctor said, this was before I knew about the family history. So my doctor said, so maybe after about nine months to a year, you can try and come off of it. And so I was fine for about nine months to a year. Um, so we first tried to come off of it, um, tapered slowly, didn't work, tried again after three months, didn't work. Third time, tried again, and the medication was no longer effective. Wow. Uh, so I started having the same symptoms again. Um, and this time around, uh, I had to go through maybe six other medications, five or six other medications before I found one that actually worked. And the only way I figured out what worked after like the fifth attempt was I called my dad's side of the family and I said, you know, I'm having these issues. Um, can somebody please tell me if anybody in our family has this? And yeah. my, my grandma, my grandma basically told me, oh, honey, you know, basically everybody on that side of the family is on medication for some form of mental illness. Wow. And I mean, I was, I was flabbergasted because nobody, nobody talks me. about it. Yeah. Nobody told me I could have 
fix this problem a long time ago, but I get it. That is the older generation and they are, un, you know, uncomfortable talking about these things because I mean, anything that involves a behavioral sort of disorder is it's taboo. I get it. But I mean, we got to, we got to just, we got to just stop doing that because. Yeah. Well, what's interesting to me, um, because I mean, I connected with you because I went through, um, not too long ago, a really bad state, um, you know, part of my life where I was really depressed. And when you're talking about, um, you're talking about the lack of appetite, the losing weight, um, and just not like just feeling really weird. Um, but I, mine was trauma induced. So it's interesting to me because you don't hear a lot of people talk about, um, hereditary mental illness and, and, you know, you, when you think of people that are depressed or, um, you know, haven't, you think of, you don't think of, you know, depression could be hereditary or, you know, just there's an imbalance in there. And, and so, right you know, you, you're like, okay, well, and then, you know, of course for so long, depression has, ha- has really carried a bad stigma because there's a lot of people yeah. that, that don't think depression is real, or they think you're just sad. Um, I mean, I know for me just, you know, ignorantly when I was younger thinking of depression as, okay, well, you know, you just have to, it's a mindset. You just have to be happy. You have to just think happy thoughts yep. when it's not. And, and, yeah. and, and then for it to be something to find out that this actually could be hereditary, um, yes. is very eye opening to me. And I'm sure a lot of people that are listening to this. Um, so right. yeah, that's, that's an incredible yeah. story. And like you said, share it with your family. So, you know, yes. that, so that those that need help can get help quicker. You could have gotten help a lot quicker. Right. Had you have known that this was an issue that runs in your family. Um, right. But yeah. wow. I mean, you like, and then I wanted to talk to you, like how incredibly strong you were to seek the, the help um, by checking yourself into a, um, you know, to a facility that could help you. So when you right. say, um, if you, if you don't mind, I don't want to go like too deep for you. And you could just let me know when, if, if it's something that you don't want to talk about and that's completely okay. But when you talk about your suicidal thoughts, um, this is, that's, that's kind of, I had moments in my depression when I just didn't care about living. So it was kind of one right. of those situations where like I would go to sleep yeah. and I'd be like, eh, if I don't wake up, like it might not be right. the worst thing in the world. Um, but when you say suicidal thoughts, you're just thinking of them or were you actually thinking of harming yourself? So at first it was just the thoughts and it was more like invasive thoughts and it would terrify me. Mm -hmm. Um, But as it progressed, um, it became more like I started thinking about, well, I can, I don't, I don't, really want to die. I just want to stop this horrible thing that I'm going through. And I don't know how else to make it stop. I mean, I don't know what it is. Yeah. I don't know why it's happening, but whatever's happening, I just, the only way that I could think of to stop it at that point was, was suicide. And I was like, I can't, you know, I have half of my brain going, God, you could just stop this pain right now. But the other half is saying, you know what, you have a two-year-old daughter who needs you. You got to, you know, you got to take care of this. Yeah. And, you know, I mean. So when you found, when you found your, um, the, the facility that you checked into, was it, um, like how easily accessible was that for you? Just, you know, for anybody that, um, that's listening that may know somebody that struggles with this, how, um, right. how was that process for you? Did, you know, I think a lot of people might would feel like it's a scary thing. Cause you see movies and you're thinking, you know, yeah. psychiatric hospital, they're str- like, right. can you explain that process to us so that uh, maybe we can just give some comfort to anybody that might be facing something like this? Right. Um, so what I, because I didn't know what it was, I just went to my local emergency room and they ran a bunch of tests on me because I initially thought like maybe I'm anemic maybe something's wrong with my digestive system so they ran all these tests and I hadn't been eating well and the doctors like 
well, you know, are you sure you don't have an eating disorder? I'm like, no, I mean, I, I, this is not normally how I am. Like I, I normally love food, right? Um, but this, you know, something is, is really wrong. And so I, I think the doctor, the emergency room doctor sensed that there was something mentally going on. And he said, um, I'm going to refer you to a psychiatrist. Can you hang on until tomorrow morning? And I said, yes. Yeah. Um, so they didn't put me in a hold, but they did say like, we're, we're going to keep you in here, you know, until you're, you're calm enough to go home. Okay. Um, Cause I wasn't like, I wasn't in a, like a state of like, panic where you're like, I'm yeah, I right wasn't. this second you were just like, I need, somebody exactly. needs to help I, me. I, I was so tired. I hadn't been sleeping well for months. And so I was just laying there like a rag doll saying, I don't know what's wrong, but I just don't feel good. I just don't feel good. And they gave me some uh, anti-nausea meds in an IV. I was kind of dehydrated too. Um, my um, potassium and those kind of levels were off because I hadn't been eating well. Cause every time I ate, I would feel like I'm going to throw up. Um, so he said, look, I, I want you to hang on until tomorrow morning and you're going to go see this psychiatrist. And that's exactly what I did. And um, my mom was there with me at the time because she was visiting from out of town. So I kind of had that, um, that sen sense of like accountability, like, okay, you're going to, she was like, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. Yeah. We're going to do this. Um and so I went, she had to leave. Uh, I believe she left the next day. I can't, it's hard for me to remember. Right. I understand. Um, she had to leave, but either way, I went to the psychiatrist. I went by myself. Um, and that is what set me on the path back to healing. And um, that first medication, you know, the waking up, feeling hungry and having slept was the first sign of hope I'd seen in months. Like I did not expect this drug to be a miracle and it wasn't, it's not like, you know, Oh, I felt like my old self right away. That's not how it was a gradual meds work. Right. Right. But the fact that it got me to functioning was like this huge sign of hope. Like this, this can be fixed. Like the, I remember waking up the next morning and yeah, I, I still felt depressed and I was still anxious, you know, and it was around Halloween. And I remember I took my daughter out trick or treating and I was, my mood was still like bad and I didn't want to be around other people because I was anxious, but yeah. I kept telling myself, like, as we were going door to door, I kept telling myself in my mind, you're eating, you're sleeping, you're healing. Yeah. You got to hold is on the to start. that. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's and, amazing. Yeah. So that, I mean, and again, despite the fact that I tried coming off that med too many times and it stopped working, um, I knew that when I went through the second round of like, okay, uh, I'm dealing with this anxiety again, I'm dealing with the feeling down again, I knew that it could be fixed that second time. Right. Um, so you already and, had that initial hope and you're like, yeah. okay, we just got to find the perfect, yes. um, you know, the perfect medication for me again. Yeah. And then, and then this is something that, um, that you, you still, you stay on. It's, uh, it's not for you. Is it something that you're staying on or what's the future yes. holding that? Okay. Right. I think, so, yeah. I mean, both of my doctors, so my old doctor moved, uh, to a, a town in the mountains and I have a new doctor, but they both agree on the fact that because it's so strong in my family, mm -hmm. it's, it's not situational. I even told my doctors, like I've been through worse stress in my life than, than at the time that this all happened. Like why now? Right. Um, and you know, my doctors both said that these things don't have to have an external trigger. They often run in families and people, uh, you know, whenever you say you're depressed people, I say, Oh, but why? It's like, it's, there doesn't have to be a reason. Right. Like, and I think that is so important. Is 
Yeah. And I think that is so important that people understand that it doesn't have to have, like you said, a trigger or something, you know, traumatic that it, it, it can just exist because it does. Um, yeah. And then, yeah. you know, we just, we need to, you know, as a society, I think it's probably definitely gotten better. And you might could attest to this, that um, we're society's becoming up more aware and understanding and we're trying to destigmatize mental yeah. health. Um, and I think that, you know, I had a conversation with some friends, um, a few weeks ago, we were actually talking about mental health and like how some of us have, you know, have experienced it older, you know, the older, we didn't have any issues right. when we were younger and then we would have it. And now we, you know, yeah. you know, a friend of mine struggles with it now. And yeah, they're, they're like, wonder why it seems like everybody's has an issue now. And it's, uh, you know, and my response to that is, is because it's acceptable now a little bit more acceptable. Right. So people are speaking up and seeking the help that they need and talking about right. it, which can be a part of the healing process too. Right. And I think the other, I, I agree with you, more people are speaking up about it, but you also have to look at it in the sense that the brain is the most complex organ in the body. There's a lot of room for failure there. There's a lot of room for, you know, things to happen for things to go wrong. It's not like, you know, your pancreas, like, okay, so my pancreas doesn't make enough insulin. I have type one diabetes or whatever. Right. There's, there's far fewer ways for other organs to go wrong than there is for the human brain. Um, so the fact that the brain is the most complex organ in the body and that we're the most complex species. Yeah. Um, I mean, you don't hear of like amoebas getting depression, right? They're <laughs> single cell organisms. Right. There's, there's only one cell. It either goes wrong or it doesn't. <laughs> um, but I think that, you know, the one in five Americans that have a diagnosed mental condition, it's probably an understatement because a lot of people still don't look for the help. They don't want to get the help. Yeah. And, or they don't again, recognize it kind of like how you, you know, the symptoms that exactly. you were telling me, like I, right. you know, I related to a few of those, but some of the ones that you were saying, like, like you yeah. said, you, you think it's, um, circumstantial or, you know, because right. of, you know, what you have going on in your life, you're stressed out. It's just my job at school, right. yada, yada. So like, right. it's so, like you said, it's so complex. There are so many different levels, um, to mental yes. illness and, and different things yes. that we have to face. So, um, yeah, yes. that's, that's an, that's an incredible story. And I'm, I'm so glad that you came on today and, and shared that because, it's, it was news. To, I mean, you know, it was news to me. I didn't realize that, yeah. you know, that it could be, you know, not triggered by something, um, just because of my right. personal experience with it yeah. was a trigger. So I'm thinking, you know, a lot of people, like exactly. a lot of people do, you have a traumatic injury or, you know, um, yeah. that happens. So and, let's, and, yeah. And those cases also don't, th those cases are absolutely valid. I mean, there's a, there's a reason why war veterans come back with a lot of mental illness too. So it, it can very much be an external trigger. It just, I think for a long time, um, people were looking at only the external and they didn't think, well, you know, I mean, some families have high cholesterol. Well, you know what? Some families have bipolar too. Yeah, and absolutely. Yeah. So wow. and famous examples like the Hemingway family. I mean, they had quite a lot of mental illness. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so we like to talk about the rise up. So how, how are you now? Where are you at now in your story? Um, I know that, um, you're a huge advocate of talking about your story. So how do you, like, how do you feel now, now that you've received, um, just so that we can, you know, talk about that and also give some hope to people that may, um, be struggling with that. Like you're, you're on your medication that's helping you and right. how do you feel? And, and you're still, you use, um, the running as a form of therapy yes. too, to help you as yes. well. So yes. you're doing great, right? I, I am doing fantastic. And that's yes, awesome. I mean, I'm, of course we all have bad days, even mm -hmm. with medication. Right. Um, there's this idea that, you know, people say, Oh, well, did you take your happy pill? It doesn't make you happy. It makes you functional. It is up to you to really take it from there. So um, I think after I discovered the whole family 
history and realized, I mean, I even confided in a few of my close circle of, you know, there were some of my daughter's um, preschool teachers that I talked to and they kind of said, oh yeah, I know what you're talking about. I went through something similar. And you realize that there's a lot of people out there that have been through this. You realize that you just never saw it. You never knew about it. Yeah. You never heard about it. And one of the things that changed in me was like, okay, I, after this whole ordeal, and now that I'm feeling better, I have two choices. I can either be a part of the solution and talk about it and show people that you can come out better on the other side of, you know, suicidal ideation and years of, you know, extreme highs and lows. Or I can stay silent and let this propagate to the next generation. Right. Um, so, you know, I, I was like, I can't, I can't stay quiet about this because that is the thing that prevented me from getting help way back when I was 16. Um, so I decided that I'm just going to be open about it. Even at work, if somebody asked me, like, I, I took three months of disability leave to, to deal with this. Right. Um, and so I told myself when I go back to work, if somebody asked me why I was gone, I'm just going to tell them the truth. Yeah. And I did that. Yeah. And I, I was, I was, of course I was a little nervous about that, but I was like, I'm not, I'm not going to lie about this. I'm not going to sweep this under the rug because the fact that I'm still alive is a, is a freaking miracle. So I'm not going to lie about it. Right. And, and um, then in doing so too, I, uh, when we open up and we share our experiences with people, um, I think that it gives hope to those that are struggling and then it just makes yeah. us feel normal. Like, you know, makes yeah. us feel seen and understood and not yeah. alone, which is the biggest, yeah. um, which is the biggest part of yeah. that. Wow. It is. So we, yeah. um, I have a few questions that I want to ask that okay. I like to ask all of my guests. Um, if you can remember, how would you describe your ambitions as a child and how you saw yourself and what you're capable of as a person? Uh, so as a child, I was a very shy, nervous, kind of, I, I, I mean, there you go. There's the family history. I was already very much like quiet, kept to myself. I was not an extroverted kid. Um, I was very bookish and I always got good grades, um, mostly because I, I mean, I had no social life, <laughs> um, but, um, I always wanted to do something creative, but I also had this fascination with space. So that's why I went into engineering. I had the grades to do it. Yeah. I, almost, I mean, I almost went into theater arts, but my mom was like, you want a paycheck, don't you? So <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> you can still like, totally go for that now. <laughs> I, I mean, to be fair, I was really mediocre. So oh, no. <laughs> um, it's better off. I'm better off. Um, versus now, I think, I, I feel like when I was younger, I had a lot to prove to people and I worked and I worked and I did that. I proved a lot to a lot of people and maybe that was the wrong reason to do what I did, but it, it got me to a point in life where I'm, I'm content. I'm happy. Um, there are days when I wish I could retire tomorrow, but yeah, I think um, we, we probably all have those often. <laughs> we all have that. I just, at this point, I wish I could do something more creative. Um, you know, cause I engineering, it was fun, but it can be very grueling. The hours can be hard. Um, and now that I have my daughter, it's like, I, I don't want to work weird hours. I don't want to do right. graveyard shift. Right. Um, so yeah. And I, there's, times when I sit down and I like to write in my journal, it's like, it would be nice to be a writer, yeah. but I mean, I, I don't, I'm, I'll pro I'm mediocre at best. <laughs> well, you can always start even, you know, you take five minutes before you go to bed and just jot down some ideas. You'll be surprised where those can go from there. What would you say? Yeah. <laughs> what would you say your stickiest struggle was that stuck with you through your journey? Or do you have any? Stickiest struggle. Oh my God. Do you want that in alphabetical order? <laughs> um, 
Wow. I, I mean, again, I think my hardest struggle and my biggest victory are still mental illness. Yeah. Um, it it's was, a, cause it's is, a daily thing. It's, is it a daily or yeah. weekly type thing just to try to like, Oh yeah. 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 It is something that, I mean, it's like, you know, diabetics have to monitor their blood sugar. It's the same thing with mental illness. You have to be able to notice the signs of like, okay, I, I I'm feeling a little down, but maybe this is temporary, right. but if it drags on for two weeks, you know, I maybe I should it. go see a doctor. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And it, you have to be self-aware enough to do that. You have to be, um, I mean, it's like any other chronic illness. You got to practice the self-care and watch your stress and eat well and exercise and try and get enough sleep because all of those things affect your mental health, all right. of them. And yeah. Did you ever have a moment when, so when you, we will say like in the thick of your struggle, when it was the hardest for you, did you ever like have an aha moment or was that aha moment when you were like, something's really wrong. I have to go see a doctor. Did you, you know, what was that like for you when you had that? Do you, um, like, you do you mean feel an like aha it's moment of an, like a aha moment in your journey where you realized what the key was to overcome, uh, your obstacles? Oh, um, yeah. So I think that moment was probably when I realized that it's not, it's, this is out of my hands. I, whatever's happening, I, I've tried everything to right. control it. And something is going so wrong that I can no longer control it to the point where I'm having these intrusive thoughts occurring to me. And I did not initiate those thoughts. Right. And that is the moment when I was like, I I'm pulling out all stops. I yeah. don't care about my pride anymore. I don't care what people think. I don't care what family and friends that believe that mental illness doesn't exist. I don't care what they think. Um, I'm going to the hospital because I can't control this and I don't want it to get to the point where my daughter goes through life without her mom because I was too proud to, right. know, to do this. Yeah. Do you um, think I'm, that your daughter pay, played a big part in that, um, oh, know, that final moment of going, okay, yeah. something's, something's got to change because yes. I have a child that I have to take care of. Yes, absolutely. It did. Um, I mean, I, I'm not a person to go back and do what if, but, mm -hmm. um, I don't know if I'd still be here if I didn't have my daughter, like being that force to say like, she's only two. What, okay. what would, what is she going to tell people about why she doesn't have a mom? Um, I can't, that, that's like a mother's first instinct is I need to do whatever I can to take care of my kid. And if that means like checking myself into the hospital to figure out what is wrong with me, then I'm going to do it because I mean, that's what moms do. We right. put aside our pride and our fear and everything else that gets in the way of being a mom so that we can heal. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So yeah, definitely. Yeah. She, yeah. So we yeah. like to talk about stepping into our, um, into our own power and not thinking of that as a bad thing. Um, how do right. you think, or what would you describe the power that you have to try and step into every day? Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, I mean, I think any woman will tell you that, well, any woman in engineering will tell you that um, you're stepping into a game that was made for men, mm -hmm. that was founded by men. And um, so that's kind of hard. Um, there's even today, even in the year of our Lord, 2021, there are still not that many female engineers out there. Um, I am the one of two women in our group. Wow. Um, the rest are guys. Um, there's other departments that are different, but 
um, I, I feel like there's just not enough, there's not enough estrogen in engineering. I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm always trying to like, do you, you know, feel recruit. like, do you feel like because you're in a, in a industry like that, that that gives you more of a, of a drive to just be like, I can do anything. And then I'm going to teach my daughter oh, that yeah. she can do anything <laughs> like yeah, woman power. <laughs> oh, it, it definitely does. And I mean, sometimes I, you know, I've done, my mom is a retired teacher, but when she was still teaching, I would go and do career day at her school. And I would talk to the kids about you know, going into engineering. And I would especially say you ladies, I want you to seriously think of a career in this field. Um, I think engineering is one of the few fields where women get paid more than guys. Um, I mean, not that that says much because there's not many of us, but right. Yeah. Um, well, it's my husband is a huge, a huge science fan. And so, uh, with our yeah. daughters, he's like, you know, we're going to, you know, we're going to buy her toys that make, you know, where she has to build things and, you yeah. know, all we, all the learning toys in the world, no, none of those, you know, free free things. So <laughs> I can totally, I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of try and balance it. I don't want to like really push my daughter, but I definitely, you know, whenever there's a, a launch of a spacecraft that I worked on or that one of my friends worked on, um, we put on the NASA channel or space flight now and I sit her down and I say, we helped build this. That's awesome. Um, that is so amazing. Had, yeah. And so she's actually old enough now that she can come to um, take your child to work day. But because of COVID, we yeah. didn't get to do that this past year so. Um, that's that's so awesome like yeah. I'm such a I'm such a huge NASA fan I anytime I see a, a shirt that's a NASA you know that's like super popular there's yeah. NASA shirts out. I have like this huge collection of NASA shirts and uh, yeah. have a lot of space tattoos so like you know I'm fangirling over here with you <laughs> the space geekery yeah um, yeah it's it's something I've always loved and you know I try and keep up with what's I mean I don't even try a lot of the guys at work you, we talk about you know so and so is launching this and did you see that so and so is trying to get a spot on this flight or you know whatever's <laughs> going on um i have colleagues that work down at cape canaveral um i think i had a few friends who've done vandenberg air force base in california um so it's it's a fun industry and it's it's really cool to be able to tell people that like you've touched stuff that's in space. Yeah. But I mean, there is this side to it that um, it's not a very thankful job. Like it's not a nursing, it's not a teaching. It's not something like a doctor who heals people. Yeah. We get, we get 20 minutes of glory while the, everybody's watching your spacecraft get launched. And then after that, it's another three to four years of blood, sweat, and tears before oh the next goodness. one. Yeah. So it's something that, I mean, you really have to enjoy the process and not just the finished product because otherwise this industry. Yeah. You wouldn't, you wouldn't enjoy it at all. So right, what, the schedule, what's, yeah, I can imagine. Oh my goodness. Uh, what's the yeah. best piece of advice that ha anyone has ever given you? Um, the best piece of advice, I mean, I, I used to have all kinds of like really motivational stuff when I was younger, but I think the best one is something that's really simple and something that someone told me uh, when I was going through the worst of my issues uh, with mental illness. And it's that you have to be kind to yourself um, and that healing happens every day we always hear people are really quick to to talk about the bad stuff like i mean everybody that's ever been put on a psychiatric medication the first thing they do is start googling it right and they start seeing all the horror stories but how often do you hear of the success story of someone coming out of this and being like oh yeah that antidepressant really like it gave me my life back. I can eat now. I can sleep now. And I'm glad I trusted the process. You never hear that. Like no. people will always go online or in person or whatever to talk about the bad stuff. And so that's one of the things that 
I try to combat on my Instagram and basically on any social media is that you have to tell the good side too. Right. Because if you're just, you, if you go Googling that, I want you to find my success story. If you find the hashtag Paxil or Mirtazapine, I want you to see that those medications saved my life. I want right. you to see that, you know, you're going to see like a million bad stories. You've got to see the good ones because healing does happen. You may not see it because people are not as willing to talk about the good stuff as they are about the bad, but it does happen. And it happens every single day. Um, and once people heal, nobody, they're not going to say, Oh yeah. Yeah. I'm going to go online and tell everybody how great my healing process was. Right. I mean, we wish That's that people I would, right. Yeah. Yes. We wish that people right. would. So, right. um, don't yeah, be afraid. So. You know, I think that a lot of times people yeah. are just, you know, they're afraid of, you know, opinions, like you said, and things like that. Right. So, um, but yeah, now that, uh, mental, mental, mental health is definitely, um, we're, we're getting there. We're not there yet, but we're definitely yeah. getting there. Um, so that's, that's great. That's great advice. Um, what would right. be the best piece of advice that you would give a younger version of yourself who is in the thick of your struggle? Um, I think that I would tell my younger self something really simple. You're going to be okay. Just, you're going to be okay. Hang in there. Um, and again, I would tell them healing happens every day because sometimes that's all you need to hear. Like that's you, if you want to live to see tomorrow, sometimes all you need to hear is having somebody tell you that healing happens every day and tomorrow might be your day. Right. And having people tell me like, be kind to yourself and healing happens every day made me feel a little less hard on myself for not getting better faster not seeking help sooner. It was just like, it, you, you feel like you can just breathe around people that tell you that it's like, okay, Ugh. just yeah. just be kind to yourself. Absolutely. You know? Just healing happens. Hang in there. That is you know? fantastic advice, April. Yeah. Thank you so much. Oh my sure. goodness. Like I, you're just amazing. Like, thank you for sharing your story and being so open with it. Um, I want to thank you so much on behalf of our team and every single person who heard your story and connected with it today. Um, after this podcast, I'll be heading straight to my easel and creating a painting that represents what I personally felt and saw from your story. Um, if anyone is interested in seeing the process or getting one of the few limited prints as a reminder to step into your own power, you can follow us on Instagram at I am power club, and we will continue with this story there. Thank you so much for listening in today. I want to thank April again for sharing her story and sharing her encouragement. Um, if you or anyone you know is struggling with mental illness or you think that you might be, I'm going to link some sources down below that you can check out. Um, I want to thank James Agency for the production of the podcast. I definitely couldn't do it without you. Um, and of course, the listeners, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you personally felt connected to the story and you would like to purchase one of the limited edition prints that goes along with it to help support the podcast, you can do so at Jessica James. James.com. That's J E S C A J A Y M E S.com. And of course, don't forget to follow us on Instagram at I am power club and like, and subscribe to this channel and this video so that you don't miss next week's episode of I am power. See you then.